Dr. Tom Gingera is joining us today. He is Dr. RNA. <laughs> I don't think you need to worry about protein, do you? <laughs> <laughs> Not too much. So Tom got his PhD at NYU and then came here to do his postdoc and was here from 76 to 79, but then he somehow moved from the East Coast to the West Coast, I don't quite know why, to California, and had a few, worked at a few universities, from what I understand, and then in 93, moved to Appymetric, a wonderful company for all our microarrays, right? And he was there for 15 years, he started as director of molecular biology research, became vice president in 97. And while there, uh, in 2002, he was one of the few awardees around the country to um, have grant money to start the, the ENCODE consortium, which you all now are familiar with, which has over 300 participants. And so working on that, he continued working on that and then moved back here, yay, to Cold Spring Harbor in 2008 and was appointed as professor and head of functional genomics here to hold an adjunct professorship and the genetics program at Stony um, at Stony Brook, which is part of the State University. And so we are looking forward to hearing the talk entitled Organization and Dissemination of Information from the Genome and What is a Gene? Thanks, Tom. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I realize it's Friday afternoon, and I'm, I'm probably the only person standing between you and the bar, so I'll try to make this uh, uh, s as simple as possible. I hope it's not a monologue really, because um, I think you'll find a few things that I have to say may prompt you to want to say what or no or whatever, but please, uh, please do that pl or ask any questions that you'd like, okay? Okay, let's begin. I thought I'd give you just a five minute uh, history of, um, of next generation sequencing, all right? And everything that I say here is applicable to RNA-seq. All right, so uh, just in your mind, just make the conversion, although a lot of these uh, examples uh, are guided towards doing genomic DNA uh, sequencing. I'm, <coughs> I have the uh, dubious uh, distinction of actually having uh, worked with all of these methods. Uh, uh, and so I, I can actually say that I, I have uh, the scars to prove some of them. Anyway, so. Um, I, I think it's important to understand that as today we, we, we um, sequence literally, all right, uh, hundreds of millions of bases, you know, in a, in a, sit, in a sitting, right? And it, no one thinks about it. It's just a simple thing that you put your sample in, you get millions and millions of data points, right? But when I came to this lab as a postdoc, the first thing that I had to do was to figure out what the recognition site were for these strange enzymes called restriction enzymes, which there were only three known at the time, all right? And you, uh, Rich Roberts, who was my uh, <coughs> advisor, said, no one can work in the lab on any project that you came here to work on until you found at least one new restriction enzyme, okay? And that fortunately, it was very easy to do that because any bug you opened up uh, had a type two restriction enzyme. And so um, uh, the, part that he didn't say was that you actually had to not only identify a new enzyme, which is relatively easy to do, but actually identify what the site of recognition was for it. And that required much more work. And one of the steps in doing that was to carry out a sequencing reaction um, of the cleave products. Now remember, these cleave products all will have the same sequence at the ends of, where the, of, the, of the fragments, all right? And once it passes the uh, the recognition site, then it degenerates to whatever part of the genome it's in. So you have a way, as long as you could identify the uh, flanking sequence to the, to the cleavage site, of finding out where that is. And that could be done by, first of all, just taking the cleavage products, labeling the five prime ends, all right, with a radioactive tracer, degradate, degrade everything down to single nucleotides, and see which nucleotide actually compared to uh, references came up, and that would be your first base in the rec in the uh, right after the cleavage site. Now, in order to find the next base, you carried out a process called the wandering spot method. All right, and uh, I'm I, I could go on and on about stories about this, but literally, nearly as far as I can determine, this is the single method that was responsible for the most damage ever done at universities around the country. All right, uh, in terms of uh, experimentation and accidents. 
and unfortunately, one or two people have lost their lives doing this, but no one told us that when we started this. It was done by basically two-dimensional electrophoresis. You actually took the products that had been cleaved and labeled at the five prime end, and you, you did sort of a, um, a, uh, a, a, a carefully titrated degradation with a variety of enzymes that cleaved uh, two, left two bases, three bases, four bases, plus lots of other things, all right? But if you had a method of resolving out the two bases, you could see what they were, and, and the three bases and so forth. And since all the bases up until the uh, end of the site was, were the same, you would get a single spot for each one, right? First, but the, this, carry, this is done by first carrying out electrophoresis uh, in a, on a strip of nitrous cellulose, over in a bin that was about this size, this tall, and had two sides with a glass uh, partition, and uh, it had buffer on either side, just as you would as electrophoresis, but it was topped with this incredibly light oil that they used to, to um, lubricate uh, jet aircraft engines. So it had this very high heat conductivity. So they could actually cool it because we were going to generate so much heat during the electrophoresis. So literally, you had about 25, 30 gallons of this highly explosive, highly volatile material, which you were running literally 6,000 volts over, over OK? And, and so and the strips are like four feet long, five feet long. And you know, so you would run them in, until you got resolution in one dimension which usually was a charge dimension, okay? Yeah? Is that why it's called the wondering spot? You're wondering why you're doing it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so uh, anyway, the, the, uh, the spots themselves um, in the second dimension were done based on size. And what you, in the end, got two or three, dim uh, three levels. So if, it, if the first base was a C, then you would know the order here of what the, where T would wind up and where G would wind up. And you would actually just go from position to position uh, where, you know, what those next nucleotides would be. And that, and that gave you roughly anywhere from two to eight nucleotides. All right? And that was a really, really, really good two weeks worth of work. And that was really successful, two, you know, two to eight nucleotides. And then here... Uh, two people died in Harvard, actually. Harvard's lab burned down uh, three times. Because of the oil? Yeah, because, because the thing uh, ignited. They were done in a room in Demerick, if you go by, which was sealed off, all right? And it had a, um, a sensor that if a fire took out, it would just close the door, except you weren't going to get out of there. Uh, <laughs> Anyway, so things got better, okay, thanks, thanks to uh, uh, Alan Maxim and, and Walla Gilbert. And uh, in 1982, um, this is a map, this is a profile of adenovirus, what I which I also worked on. And this is a chemical cleavage method, which I won't go through, and uh, many of you probably already know about it. Uh, and which at, at the end of the day gave you roughly somewhere between 25 and 65 nucleotides, you know, at the time per run. Then came uh, <coughs> Fred Sanger's dideoxy sequencing method, and we jumped by almost twofold in, in roughly the same amount of time. The number, and this was a chain termination method using polymerase as a method to uh, elongate uh, using chain terminators. And then this um, led us to a very different kind of approach to do sequencing, all right? Uh, and in the 1980s and all the way through roughly the beginning of uh, 2000, where uh, either direct sequencing by hybridization or indirect sequencing by basically knowing what the sequence was and asking wh whether that sequence was present on the array using tiling arrays. And you could, you could now jump fr from very serious numbers in, in terms of the amount of data you could collect. And this is, um, you know, solid phase hybridization as a method to actually either do de novo sequencing, which was less successful using arrays, but certainly resequencing by using tiling arrays. And, and really it totally revolutionized and really made it possible to think about 
doing large scale high throughput sequencing or resequencing in, in a very cost effective manner. And then, um, <clears throat> then this of course uh, has led us to the current state where we have uh, Illumina sequencing, where we have terminator removal synthesis, and now we're up to where we are today in terms of uh, Interesting though, the most current methods in, in terms of long, um, long length uh, sequencing using single molecules uh, as the targets or back down to very few numbers of nucleotides that we can actually do in a given uh, experiment uh, uh, because we're doing single molecules and we're doing few of those molecules at a time, right? So that is, you know, a, a cartoon ver version of the history of uh, high throughput sequencing. I thought, it would be useful to think about that because everything that we're going to talk about today rests on the shoulders of all of this technology development. And the one thing that needs to be said about all of this is that everything that all of this technology and all the biology that has come from it has also been dependent on the evolution of the computational tools that allow us to interpret uh, both the raw signals that were coming from these uh, elements and the implication of what those sequences are and how they relate to things that we know about. So computation has played a, an essential role in terms of the development of doing high throughput uh, sequencing and genomic studies. Okay? All right. So in about the year, uh, actually in exactly 1998, the end of 1998, um, it was clear that um, the human genome was actually going to be finished, and it was going to be finished probably within a year or two years, you know. And um, the thought was, you know, this whole infrastructure, I mean, uh, this is, uh, now we have, this is an editorial, okay, so you take it as an editorial. You know, once you start putting money into a, to a branch of science and build a very large set of infrastructure, all right, it's very, like any other organization, any other enterprise, it's hard to actually just throw all that away, say it's done, we're not gonna do that anymore, okay? And um, so lots of institutions had invested heavily and built very sophisticated and very accomplished mechanisms by which um, a sequencing could be done to get the human genome sequence. And then the thought was, well, what are we gonna do next, you know, really? And a whole institute, by the way, of, at NIH had been developed just to do this program. It's called the Human Genome uh, Institute. And so were they going to go out of business? I mean, were they actually going to take an institute and say, oh, thanks, guys, you did a great job. Go find another job. This is not what happened, right? And so a uh, very serious consideration was given to what was going to happen to this uh, product, the human genome product, once it was done. And... Um, Again, again, a subtitle, editorial. Um, the, uh, the danger was it wasn't just a matter of picking the best idea. You could have imagined that the simple thing was, hey, we'll use the human genome to help solve this disease, cancer, all right, or you know, uh, autism, or some neurological uh, disease. Well, the problem is that that's how NIH is set up. You have all these vested interests called the institutes who specialize in these different areas. And they didn't want some newfangled Institute come along and basically start eating from their, uh, you know, feeding trough. So that was it. The, they had to find something else that would actually wind up helping and contributing to the collective effort of what NIH. Now that's a very cynical way to put it, but that's really what, what I think is fair to say. Anyway, uh, the project they came up with in in the year uh, 2000, roughly, was this idea that. Uh, once we have the sequence, um, we need to understand where the functional domains are. We're, we have the sequence, you know, we think we know where a lot of the protein coding genes are because we have a lot of good genetic mapping done. We have lots of um, individual gene sequencing and we could sort of find all the things that we knew about, but was that the only stuff was there? Plus, we didn't know very much about the regulatory elements of the, of the genome and where were they? And, and replication, where were the replication sites? And there were a, a, a slew of questions that could be a, asked of the sequence that had a much more higher level uh, application that could be uh, uh, approached 
by looking at these uh, sequences and uh, beginning to catalog them by the functions that they had. All right? And so Emerge was a, pro a project called the Encyclopedia of DNA Elements, called ENCODE. And um, it, it basically took on the a role of being able to find, at many different levels, functional elements. And that, um, as you can sort of see from this cartoon, was a, a, a variety of things, such as where do transcription factors bind? Where does, what, what is the state of chromatin along the genome, uh, an active genome? Uh, uh, where is the open and where are the closed regions? You know, where are the regions that are being uh, transcribed? Where are the regions that are being replicated? And uh, what are the products that, of that transcription? You know, what are the uh, products of the processing of those transcripts? There are a large number of uh, projects that were uh, conceivable, but in, 19, in 2002, the, that effort started with about five groups, uh, which focused primarily on DNA sen one sensitivity uh, and on um, RNA transcription and uh, transcription factor binding and chromatin modifications. Those were the primary product, uh, projects that were started with, uh, in, the, in the phase one of ENCODE, which was a pilot phase, which dealt with uh, roughly 1% um, uh, of the human genome. It wasn't a random collection. It was actually hand-picked sections of the human genome, 1% of the genome. And, uh, and the thought was, if we could actually see that this was a, a, a successful effort, a, a productive effort, then, we, then NIH could consider uh, expanding this effort to the entire genome. But most importantly, most importantly, could you see, could we see in this uh, overall endeavor the ability to improve technologies so that the, the ability to go after the entire genome was feasible and economically realistic, all right? And that's what happened in phase one, which went which was only supposed to be uh, four years to 2006, but went to 2007. And then from 2007, um, after that project was finished in 2008, uh, phase two began, which is the work on the entire genome. All right, and it finished about uh, 2010, and now phase three is ongoing, uh, and that probably will be the last phase, although there's no definitive. Um, uh, Oh, it was very, I mean, it was very, um, very rudimentary. Uh, it was, there were regions, very simply, that, um, that were known to be fairly well uh, identified as containing um, protein coding genes. And those regions were, you know, about one megabase regions, one to two megabase regions were picked out where those were occurring. And then there were regions that were known to be, um, lacking any detectable or known genes uh, that were there. And then those regions were also picked out. And that's roughly how the entire program was divided up into. Okay. Okay. All right. So that's the background. And how long did that take us? That took us, uh, oh. all right, 15 minutes. All right. I, I, I want to though talk to you about RNA-seq specifically because that's the project that I know most about since we were involved with it from the very beginning. And I'd like to do it into <clears throat> three parts. The first is I'd like to give you an update of, of uh, our, our current approximation of what the annotated genome looks like with respect to genic regions transcripts that are, uh, that are currently there and uh, using the best data that we have, right? Uh, and then I'd like to provide uh, a dis some discussion points based on what I think are some interesting lessons that we learned from the f at least the first two phases of ENCODE, all right? And then finally, I'd, I'd really like to challenge you, all right, to be begin to think about the, uh, the information that's coming out of the genome as actually being something that's not confined to the cell. In fact, it is a means by which the cell, cells talk to each other and how populations of cells talk to each other using that information in the, in the form of RNA, all right? So let's start there. All right, so currently, um, <clears throat> as of roughly 2013, the, the, uh, and I'll tell you why it's not done yet for 2014 in a second, but 
uh, roughly in, um, in this, uh, this pie chart is summarized in this small table here, which is entirely too, too complicated to, to, for you to uh, see probably or to understand. But in, in roughly in 2010, um, right after uh, fa you know, phase, um, almost phase two was finishing, uh, there were about 151 genic regions all right, uh, identified. And as of 2013, there's about 157,000 genic regions. So that number really hasn't increased very much over that uh, three-year period. The number of protein coding uh, regions uh, is est was estimated to be about 40% in 2007 and dropped to about 35,000 most currently. And that means that at least one transcript in that locus all right, all right, has evidence of it being translated. All right, so only 35% of the genic regions have evidence that protein is actually coming out of those loci. All right? Now, if you look at, instead of just loci, the number of transcripts that are being made all right, in those loci, in 2010, it was about 161,000 loci. And currently, it's almost 200,000 uh, transcripts that are being made, roughly about 8 to 10 transcripts as a median per loci. And Protein coding transcripts is a, was about 47% and is now decreased to about 41%, which means less than every, half of transcripts made in every genic region all right, are not intended to be translated. Right? They're non, as far as we can determine, right, non-coding. Now, the caveat in this is, as far as we can determine, they do not have the characteristics of what we have, uh, what we have seen as being protein coding transcripts, that is to say codon usage, that is to say uh, size of the, op of the open reading frame, that is to say signals for processing for uh, uh, translation. They ha if, if they're being made, they're being made in a, into proteins and, and, and used in translation, they're being utilized in a fashion that is somewhat different than what we currently have seen as a canonically translated protein. Right? So, Rightly or wrongly, they are now called non-coding translate. Now, people are challenging that in some ways, right? Because people have identified the ability for these regions to be, uh, for, for long non-coding RNA to be translated somewhere in its length by, you know, to about 80 to 100 amino acids. But this is still a very controversial area, and it's not clear how much of this non-coding kind of transcription is going to fall into that category. Now. Um, this no this is this is the cumulative body of knowledge that we have collected up until uh, two, uh, 2013 no, no, we, were just, we were just looking at one of the just, I had my, we were looking at some of my data today and there was a huge number of transcripts that were just like they weren't yeah. right uh, so why isn't the number most recently uh, mo uh, most um, most currently up to date the genome has, the, the latest version of the assembly of the genome, all right, uh, is, uh, has been finished, and the annotations for that uh, is, are, are being completed. And so the, really the, the uh, work on annotating, this is basically all being hand curated by a part of the uh, ENCODE project called GenCode, being uh, carried out in the, uh, in the Wellcome Trust uh, in the UK. And the GenCode group has been, of course, continuing to work, but they have, they've sort of held off until uh, this new version is finished annotation, and then we can carry over everything to the new annotation, because that is a big job. Uh, I won't get into the detail, but actually changing the, the human genome assembly, which won't actually get a lot more sequence. There will be some new sequence in the assembly, but annotating it will actually be an immense, uh, and then relating one annotation to another is a big job. And so they're holding off on in changing these numbers until uh, the sum this sometime this summer. All right. Now, again, uh, this, this, these numbers, all these numbers and things, um, have uh, uh, some implication as to how much of the genome is actually active or not, and depending on what you mean uh, by active. If you're talking about transcription, whether you're talking about poly A plus, poly A minus, or all uh, RNAs that you see, uh, and you plot the, uh, the percent of the genome covered uh, versus the 
uh, signals that give rise to where those genome, uh, those signal, those regions are coming from. All right. So, for example, let's just take this poly A plus set of signals. As far as we can determine, based on cumulatively all the evidence that we have so far, that roughly about 43, 44 percent is embodied in poly A plus transcripts. All right. In terms of coverage. All right. 44 percent of the mappable portions of the genome. All right. This is an important uh, issue. We're talking about, yeah? Are these exclusive of uh, repetitive elements? Mappable portions of the genome, right? Uh, right. Does you, that include? Well, in, in, in some cases, yes, because there is enough polymorphism in the genome, even within a, a repeat region, that you can actually site specifically map, all right? There are many other regions which that cannot happen, all right? And all we know is that that, that class of repeats is is likely to be um, expressed, but not with a very specific. So in those regions that are mappable, those yes, they they have they they in the yes they're uniquely mapping to only one site. All right, with an with a mismatch ra rate of less than usually two mismatched nucleotides for any read. Okay, right. so. 44% or 42% rather of the genome is poly A plus, but if you look at the signals, all right, giving rise to that 40 somewhat percent, you can you have this gradation, all right, from very sort of reasonable uh, or, or um, FPK, FPKM values to almost something less than one copy per cell, much less than one copy per cell, all right. Uh, so most of these are distributed over roughly 0.5 uh, FPKM, which is close to one copy per cell, all right? And the, you can see what happens for poly A+. And now if you look at all uh, RNAs uh, of all types, then um, you see this very large increase of very low signal giving rise to most of the coverage, all right? Now, why, why do I make this point? Because of this. If you, you ask yourself, why should I care about a transcript that's detected at less than one copy per cell? All right? And because, in, in fact, that may be just, it may be that it's just simple biological background, all right, or mismapping of the reads that are there. All right? And so what do you do about that? Well, that may be true, but it also may be true you have something like this. JAS1F is an apo a, uh, anti apoptotic is an anti-apoptotic protein uh, that's made, and it's a cytosolic uh, uh, messenger RNA. Uh, this is a, some work we've done with Arjun Ra at the University of uh, Pennsylvania, and who developed this method of uh, using numerous labeled oligonucleotides, fluorescently labeled, to hybridize to messenger RNAs along its length, so that each of these dots represent multiple probes lighting up a single messenger RNA. So these, each of these dots is, is a single messenger RNA. And you can see that these cells have roughly somewhere in the order of 10 to 15 copies per cell and predominantly cytosolically uh, localized, all right? This HOXD10 is an important developmental protein, as many of you probably are well aware, uh, but it has, it has an antisense transcript, all right, uh, on the other strand that's present at less than 100 copies per cell. So you, it's a signal that's very rarely seen, all right, and ha you'd have to do enough statistics on this in many enough cells to say, oh, well, at least it's consistent. It may not be, uh, and it's not a technical piece of noise, but it is certainly low. And so why should we care about it? The reason we might care about it is the fact that in the cells where you see this uh, evidence of this expression, roughly one out of every hundred cells has this signal, all right, where the nucleus, all right, lights up with about 10 copies per cell in one out of every hundred cells, which means that the, the, the gene program that's going on in that cell apparently is different than the program that's going on in the surrounding cells, all right. And this is underscored by all the single cell work that's now going on, where individual cells are seen to be operating slightly different uh, gene programs within the, the confines of those cells. And so our work, all our work, you know, I'm, I'm sure everybody in this room, all our research 
which has been previously done on the level of populations of cells, all right, is the sum of all of these kinds of activities. All right? And so when we see activity like this, it, at a very low level, it could well be an artifact all right, or a biological, a biological or technical, but it also could, in fact, uh, underscore a, a program that's going on in the very um, minor population uh, in the uh, members of the population. <clears throat> now, this whole concept of how many, uh, you know, the coverage of the gene, how much is uh, of the genome, and you know, uh, what, and how many genes are being expressed, how many genes are in the in the genome, sort of leads us to this um, uh, idea that there that there. Uh, this idea of a gene is a sort of centralized concept that we use to measure individual information units inside uh, the, the genome. Remember now, the word um, gene came from you know, Hansen's uh, uh, studies in the beginning of the 20th century, where they needed a term. They needed a term uh, which captured the idea that there was something carried in the cell from generation to generation all right, that was somehow correlated or responsible for a phenotype that they were actually looking at. Of course, there was no idea of DNA and there was no idea of you know, transcription or any, any molecular or mechanistic. It was just something that was clearly going to be transferred and you could in some ways understand at, uh, at that time, having uh, Mendel's work being rediscovered you know, uh, from its original uh, uh, fi findings, that this idea of a gene uh, needed to be something connected to phenotype and inherited. All right? And so it never had a physical uh, connotation, all right, really. It was a concept, it was a higher order concept, all right, whose underpinnings were unknown at the time. All right? And so, but they had, the idea of a gene basically brought these kinds of implications, that they were bounded elements, they were elements, they were discrete elements, that was the supposition, right? And the, the next thing is that the functional, uh, uh, I, the functional, functional characteristics of that element were, were thought to be relatively dedicated. And I'll explain why I'm going through this in a second, as we move to sort of the age of molecular biology, right, in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, all right? And finally, genes were primarily, in, uh, uh, in later on, equated with protein coding elements, all right, for the most part. Now, the idea of gene, of course, was then sort of captured, all right, and held hostage by molecular biology because it was a very functional unit. Once we could actually sequence something, once we could actually ge genetically identify something and connect it to a physical reality, a piece of DNA, all right, then this took on the name gene all right, overall. Now, <coughs> with these characteristics, now this, um, <coughs> this has a, a fundamentally um, uh, flawed uh, premise. In 2003, <coughs> excuse me, if you look at a given, any given region in the genome, you often saw regions lined up like this, namely genes in a row, single regulatory regions, even if you had multi-isoforms for these, they were sort of beads on a string, all right, uh, lying along the genome. But now, <clears throat> we know and have known for several years now that although this was uh, what I'm about to say was true for some regions in two, in, you know, before 2003, now the pro large uh, proportion of the genome currently ha is built like this, where you have um, gene regions which are overlaid with other genic regions on both strands. So you have transcription going on in both directions. And you have promoters and regulatory regions embedded in the bodies of what we presumably call genes. All right? And so in addition, <coughs> even if you went back and looked at these discrete gene genic regions, as the number of isoforms increased for any given genic region, the discovery was that promoters, regulatory elements for some of those isoforms all right, were different. And they were also buried in the bodies of another isoform for the same gene. Now, what does that, you know, what's the implication of that? 
The implication of that is that if we do a straightforward uh, correlation between a mutation, a variation at a given locus, all right, and there's more than one functional element sitting in that region, a promoter, an enhancer, a, uh, a, a coding exon, a regulatory exon, a, uh, a silencing a, uh, region, if a mutation falls in a region and that covers multiple functions like that, what is the actual cause of the phenotype? And if the gene is actually connected to the phenotype, what's the gene? So I think this is uh, a, a question that um, you know, we, we're sort of dealing with now and trying not to actually uh, solve right now because it's very complicated. All right? and because it would mean a fundamental change of what is our concept of what's inherited all right, and what is overall the underlying cause for phenotypic change. Isn't it still like associated with a certain locus, even though there's three genes in that area? Wouldn't you say it's still associated with a certain <clears throat> locus? Or are you thinking about long distance interaction? Well, let me finish this slide and, and then I'll get right to your point. So I think one, one idea that one could posit in this is basically that the functional unit, the actual atom of inheritance, isn't necessarily the uh, given locus which we call a gene. It's actually a given locus which is transcribing a given set of transcripts, right, and its functional elements. And so the, the, the atom becomes the transcript, all right? And so if a phenotype, if a phenotype is governed by multiple kinds and, uh, and types of transcripts, all right, then gene takes on its original implication, that it's a higher order concept. It is the collection of all regulatory and transcriptional units all right, that, are, that contribute to the, uh, to the phenotype that's present. So to get back to your, quest your question, the, the locus itself right, could have three, four, you know, ten functional elements listed there. And if only one of the, uh, if the mutation right, is actually really affecting only one of them with relationship to the, to the phenotype, then the functional element that's affected and inherited, all right, is, uh, that's, that's the atom for it. But it may well be that... No, I think, I think that's not, not necessarily true. I mean, it, it, it could affect the, it will of course affect other elements, but they may be totally neutral for those other elements, right? It may not affect the, the overall phenotype. But what I think what's really challenging in this is that if this holds true, then other transcripts which are leading to the same phenotype, all right, maybe one other or a hundred other are leading to the same, they would be, constitute one gene, all right? So instead of saying, you know, we're going to look for the Hox locus, all right, or, you know, or um, Hox gene or exist or something like that, one of, a gene which we think we, we understand somewhat well, and, and uh, it, the, 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 the connection between the phenotype and the gene is well established, we, we now actually have to go to the idea that we have transcripts 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, all right, which is responsible for this phenotype, and the gene is the collection of all those. Uh, uh, those. That's, you could imagine, I mean, it's easy to imagine how, how challenging that would be to th change our thinking in that, that terms. But I would posit that that's ultimately where we're going to go in this, in, 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 with this in increased understanding of the complexity of, of uh, information stored in the genome. Anybody want to say no more? <laughs> how, how does that play into like if you're looking at intrinsic development and you have you know things that are kind of you know uh, I would say kind of multifactorial. Mm -hmm. Like how, how does that play into that? Like you know, so like if you look at environment, you look at the genetic, multiple multiple hits to an individual during development yes. across a very range of phenotypes. Uh -huh. How is how is that how is that kind of recruited? well I. I uh, let me just take one of, one of those uh, ideas, because there are several there. 
one of the appealing things, uh, I, I think, about this kind of model for the, for the genome is that it helps explain things which we have somewhat a difficult time understanding. Namely, let's think of the term penetrance, all right? The concept of penetrance is actually uh, not well understood for many, many uh, uh, phenotypes. And the simple thought is that different mutations affecting the same element, of course, either by itself or interacting with other things, explains the penetrance of that, uh, of that particular mu uh, mutation or the, the severity of that phenotype, right? But if, in fact, it's the, the, the fact that even if, you com even if you confine the effect of that mutation to one locus, you could have multiple different functioning transcripts affected in different ways. And the combinatorics of that lead, gives rise to the difference in penetrance that are present, that's present. Right. So, and if you couple that to the idea that there are many different loci doing the same thing, you can get very complex penetrance uh, effects, right? With, because you have complex interactions going on each of those loci, right? Is this functional redundancy? Um, it depends. I mean, I, I, it, redundancy in the sense that they contribute to the same phenotype, and depending on how complex the phenotype is, yes, then it's, it, it's because they're all working to affect uh, a, a, a wild-type phenotype on this, right? But if they are, if we're talking about less complex, then the, they're likely to be fewer loci involved and likely to be fewer uh, transcripts involved, okay? Okay, so um, I, I just want to cover, oh my goodness, um, some uh, ideas about um, what we've learned from ENCODE. I'll, I'll do this relatively rapidly and, and just, so if you want me to slow down or stop, just let me know. So the first, one of the first things we, we, we um, I, I think we learned from these, these uh, uh, studies was that transcript low copy number ranges are, are often reflect the functional type of the transcript that is going on. What do, what do I mean by that? Um, we know that there are many different uh, compartments in the genome, and there are many different types of RNAs that are found in those compartments, having very different functions, all right? If you take um, many different kinds of RNA, all right, RNA from the nucleus, RNA from the cytoplasm, RNA from the nucleoplasm, RNA from the chromatin, if you take the poly A plus RNA, if you take poly A minus RNA, if you take RNA smaller than 200 nucleotides, if you take all of those pieces of information, right, and build a map, a density map, right, the compartmentalized density map, you get something like this. And this is based on, oh, um, several hundred types of samples. And what you see is that if this, this cloud that you see here, it's kind of reddish cloud. It is composed mostly of protein coding, uh, annotated protein coding elements that are in the gen code uh, collection of annotated genes, all right? And the range of expression over multiple uh, cell types, right? So uh, each dot is the expression level of that protein coding gene in a different cell type. So you can have the same uh, gene represented multiple times. It's just that in a different uh, uh, cell type. And what you see is that the, uh, this cloud of expression right, basically nucleates in the cytosol. So you find it mostly in the cytosol, right, and you have an expression range that's roughly about four, uh, about four to six logs all right, in expression. All right. So this class of RNA, all right, whether it be protein coding, whether it be non-protein coding, poly A plus, all right, or not, it's mostly found in the cytosol and ranges over six logs. If you now go to the annotated class, again, annotated, well-documented, we know the boundaries of these, these transcripts, uh, and they appear to be non-coding, that is to say they don't have the same characteristics as the coding ones, you shift the, the, uh, the epicenter of this cloud to a more nuclear uh, um, uh, 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 concentration, and its, con its area, uh, its dimension of expression varies uh, 
again, about four to five logs, uh, but, but its highest levels are, are roughly equivalent to the highest levels of the coding transcripts, or, or the sort of middle range of the coding transcripts. Right? So overall, as a population, it's a much uh, lower expressed group, and it's much more uh, likely to be found in a nucleus. Then finally, things that are more recently found, right, from that 2007 to the 2013 uh, dates, right, those are even lower expressed and clearly, clearly nucleate in the, in, uh, within, the nucleus, within the nucleus. So this, this sort of uh, gradation of expression and their compartmentalization somehow begins to point us in the direction that function, all right, of these things are somehow correlated with the levels of expression. All right, the other sort of um, lesson, which I think is sort of general lesson, which, uh, 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 which actually was somewhat surprising when, when we first saw it, is that the number of expressed isoforms of a gene does not follow a minimalistic strategy. So if you have, two, uh, if, let's say, three, four isoforms of a gene, all right, it isn't as if one is picked out by a cell or a developmental step. Right? And well, how does that... How does that work? Um, the, in uh, UDP glucotransferase, uh, this family of genes are known to have nine different, um, or I think 12 different um, uh, TSS uh, uh, isoforms with about uh, nine different TSS sites. And this, so that means they have, they have nine different um, uh, regulatory elements for this uh, for this RNA. This is the same here, and you can see that where you see them most, which isoforms you see in which tissues mostly expressed. If you now go back and ask for the entire isoform expression pattern within uh, human cells and many different types of human cells, if you ask if you see um, the number of isoforms expressed per gene versus the number of annotated isoforms for that gene, all right, then what you see is that if, if you have, for example, five isoforms for a given gene, all those genes that have five isoforms, all right, and the, the number of expressed isoforms on average is about four. So in a cell, this is per cell, per gene, the number of expressed isoforms isn't just one or two of the five, it's four of the five. Right? There is a predominant, or there can be a, there is most of the time a predominantly expressed one, but you see evidence of a large proportion of the isoforms being expressed in each of these. Single cell sequencing? Yes. Right? So th this, this, I think, has implication as to you know, what contributes to the overall uh, levels of expression in, in, in a given cell. And it's not, I'm sorry. yeah. Is the expression in those genes only when they're controlled by similar regulatory, oh, so, you know, it's like if you, so you're, at this point, you're not talking about, you know, uh, PRA, PRG type thing. No. You know, you know, which may be produced on the same promoter. Yes. Uh, you're talking about some, you know, say varying promoters and therefore varying, the, you know, kind of types of regulatory. It's both. It's actually both, right? Because you can have isoforms made from the same promoter, and the amount that you see in a steady state experiment like this is actually the result of many things. Not only the activity of the promoter, but the efficiency of the processing, the stability of the message after it's made, uh, the, local, you know, the ability to get at the RNA because of its localization. All we know is that in a steady state experiment has been carried out, we see this differential, which can be caused by, um, by a variety of different mechanisms. Right. Is each isoform translated? Uh, we, we don't know. But since most of the isoforms, uh, a half, more than half of the isoforms for a given locus are in fact non-coding, right, it's likely that many of the isoforms are not intended to be, uh, uh, to be translated. But we don't have direct evidence for that. Okay, finally, um, many of you uh, perhaps work in this area of enhancers and know that enhancers 
not surprisingly, um, interact with reg other regulatory elements like promoters and uh, silencers and things like that. But fairly recently, in the last two years, it w it's clear that enhancers themselves are promoters. All right, all right. That in fact um, are the regulatory elements for the transcription of predominantly poly A minus RNAs. All right, short poly A minus RNAs. So. Th there, there are now two classes of RNAs, uh, which are uh, two functions of RNAs uh, that of the poly A class that are well documented and and likely uh, and no, are known to have very specific kinds of function. One is the enhancer poly A minus class, and the other is antisense class. The, most of the RNAs made as antisense RNAs, all right, are poly A minus RNAs. So, and the simple-minded reason for that, again, without very much supportive evidence for it, is that those RNAs are intended to be turned over fairly rapidly, and you don't want them around. All right? And so the lack of a polyadenylation uh, tail enhances that likelihood of those RNAs uh, turning over very rapidly. It's not a simple linear process. It's not a simple idea of having just a whole collection of things discrete things in the genome, each of which have a sort of specific uh, role, specific regulatory element, you know. Uh, the, the genome has a lot of information which, and the strategy for, for the storing that information and using it is very much like a virus. If you go back to virus, one of the things that we learned about from virology, all right, was the fact that in limited genome sizes, you pack as much information as you can. You, you can't afford to just having these discrete elements. You have regulatory elements embedded in coding elements. You have overlapping coding el elements. You have non-coding elements you know, being transcribed. That strategy has not been abandoned by nature. All right? Despite the fact that we have three billion base pairs, all right, we are still packing lots of information into the genome. And we're using that information in different circumstances by processing, differential expression and compartmentalization. All right. And so we still, I think, have a lot to learn. I mean, because this is just one example of a whole variety of processes of processing that could go on, on in terms of things of, or transcripts that we know about. And they all may also have function. And I could talk about that also, but that, that's where I'm going to stop. And, and I'm sorry I kept you past this so you couldn't go to the bar, but you know, sorry. <laughs> I'm not going to remember this perfectly, but I remember we had some meeting where when code was mentioned, mm -hmm. I was sitting at the table with two or three very high level people. Mm -hmm. I can't even remember who exactly it was, but it was on the order of, you know, like David Baltimore and yeah, yeah. the later. I, I can't even remember who it was. Yeah. But very, very high level people, but of a, of a generation before you. And they, oh, you know one of them was? The city. Yeah. Who says just a, this is garbage? The gene is still the unit. And you've probably heard that, but mm -hmm. what would be your? And you've heard Sidney Brenner say something. Like oh yeah, that? yeah, yeah. So that's who it was. Sidney Brenner, somebody else who totally agreed with. Yeah, him. yeah. So what's your response to that? Is it just that they were schooled to one to the old model, or what? There, there, there are lots of ways. There are lots of ways you can respond to that. I'm only going to use two, two. Um, two points. One is, there will always be critics, and, some of the, and it, every, every idea has critics. Every new sort of um, paradigm. paradigm has critics, but they, they turn out to be um, true or useful depending on how many people begin to evolve using that information and adopting it into their own thinking. All right, I can say that there are at least 500 labs, you know, uh, across the, uh, the world that have published data on their papers, which they have downloaded from ENCODE. All right, and a lot of that uh, this data is utilized every day in both research and in training 
and a whole variety. Of, so it is, it, it's not seen by the scientific community as being, first of all, untrue or uh, flawed. Uh, it's certainly flawed in, uh, in, in some respects, but it's not perfect. But it's certainly useful, and it's been seen to be useful. The second point I'd like to make is that relative to Sydney, is I gave, uh, I gave this talk, I hadn't been back to Cold Spring Harbor for 25 years. When, you know, I left and I didn't come back for 25 years. And I came back to give a talk at uh, the Biology of Genomes uh, meeting. And I, I um, gave this seminar and people just looked at me and somebody said, well, how many genes are there? And I said, oh, I, I don't know, but it's got to be well over uh, several hundred thousand. And people in the audience who went just gasped, you know. And Sydney got up and said, Tom, you're scaring the out of us, okay? Because we think we know what the genome looks like and does, and you're telling us we haven't a clue, all right? And I think the answer to that is we have a clue, but we certainly don't have the entire picture. And I think, you know, if you look at the literature, and many of you do this every day, you see that when non-coding RNAs were seen as being an artifact of the technology or an artifact of biology, it's now become uh, almost a staple in, in the elements of things people look for and expect to see. So that evolution is going on. And I ex expect that many of the things that we talked about here it, have already entered into the psyche of, of research uh, individuals and soon will become their discovery. They found this. And as soon as an idea has many fathers or mothers, you know that this has become an established and, and a good paradigm. And I think that's what's happening. And you know, it will take time and effort. You know, I wrote this review in Nature several years ago. I know maybe you saw it, which basically said very simply, you know, you know, how can you prove that these things are biologically important, whatever? And I said, I can't. But uh, what I can tell you is just if. Time will, in fact, tell whether this is, in fact, real or not. And so we have to have patience, all right, and see if it turns out to be the, the case, you know, that whether people find this useful and biologically relevant, all right. And I think that's how I would, would answer that. Unless they have a final short town of some sort. Exactly, yeah. So I had a more general question. What do you think of the future of ANCODE in terms of spreading to other species, like maize, plants? <laughs> yeah. I work in maize, plants. Mm -hmm. And uh, in terms of being able to predict functionalities mm -hmm. of the sequences, like I, I see sequence and I know this is an enhancer and this looks like a promoter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so there is a, um, there, there have been uh, uh, two, pro two other programs, <clears throat> uh, one, no, actually three other programs, one called the Model Genome Encode, which um, did what was done, uh, was done for humans in flies and worms, all right, and a lot of that's come out or is it, should be out now, all right. And then there's mouse encode. So mouse has been done in the same fashion. And as for plants, um, there are applications being reviewed to do maize in the same way.